Amen. Praise God. Would you turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 6 through 16 on this morning. Um, again, chapter 2, verses 6 through 16 this morning. I want to I wanna talk a little bit about wisdom on this morning. If you were with us on last week and you heard Paul's thoughts on human wisdom from chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, it would be extremely easy for you to walk away and think that Paul is in some way anti-wisdom. It would be extremely easy for you to, to, to leave out of church on, on last week or to read that passage from, uh, from the comfort of your home on last week and say to yourself, it seems like Paul has beef against wisdom. He doesn't really like wise people. And of course, we know that to not be the case. There's a, there's a number of reasons why we know that to not be the case. The first reason that we know that to not be the case is because there is a whole section of the Bible dedicated to wisdom. There's, there's books and books and books in the Bible dedicated to wisdom. There is the Proverbs, which is a book dedicated to wisdom. In fact, they're called the wisdom books. There's Job, which most of us think about Job as a book about suffering. But Job is more than a book about suffering. Job is a book about how to manage the sufferings in our lives in a wise way. And that's why it's called a wisdom book. Do you understand that? Job is about how do I navigate the suffering of life, which is inevitable, which all of us will experience. How do I navigate that in a real way? And then there's a book about Life in general, the book of Ecclesiastes, and that is considered a wisdom book. And so we know that the Bible is all about wisdom. But another reason that we know that the Bible is all about wisdom and that Paul is not dismissing wisdom outright is because of what we find in chapter 2, verses 6 through 16. You see, Paul's critique of wisdom is not an abandonment of wisdom. It is, an, it is, it is not an abandonment of all wisdom, rather. Paul's critique is an abandonment of all wisdom that begins and ends on the wisdom of this world rather than the wisdom of God. So Paul says if your wisdom begins in the world or, or ends in human philosophy, then that wisdom is of no use. That's the point Paul is making. The Christian life does not abandon wisdom. In fact, the Christian life requires wisdom. It just requires the right kind of wisdom. Anybody that knows my family, for example, knows that we believe in the right exercise of human wisdom. We believe in counseling. We believe in therapy. We refer people regularly to counseling. My wife is heavily invested, as, you, as many of you know, in the discipline and practice of counseling and therapy. In fact, I don't think... We devote enough attention to the necessity of emotional healthiness in the life of the Christian, in the life of the church. I think we, I think we devote too little attention to emotional healthiness. So what we are not saying this morning is that there is no room for wisdom of a human form. We educate our children and we encourage them to study math and philosophy and medicine and ethics and government and economics and psychology. So all of those things are human wisdom. So what we are arguing against and what I believe Paul is arguing against is the misplacement of human wisdom to a place of ultimate significance or to a place where it is allowed to contradict God's wisdom to a place where I find my ultimate meaning in it. Does that make sense? Again, the Christian life requires wisdom. It just requires the right kind of wisdom. It requires a wisdom that carries the fear and the reverence of the Lord as its beginning and a crucified Savior at its center. It requires a wisdom that this world often sees as foolishness. Because it's a wisdom where God saves the world by dying at the hands of it. It's a wisdom where the Savior of the world overcomes the world by serving those in it. It's a wisdom where people find true life by laying their lives down. 
And this type of wisdom, no matter the time or the day or the place in which you live, and no matter the time, day, and place in which it is proclaimed, this type of wisdom will always appear foolish to the world. So Paul's beef again here is not with wisdom at large, but it is with the kind of wisdom that communicates a hope that it cannot deliver. The kind of wisdom that, that presents itself as the answer to what is ailing our souls, but offers no true remedy in the end. That's what Paul is confronting. And so let me ask you a question this morning. What does that kind of wisdom look like? What does the empty wisdom look like? The human wisdom that finds its significance in, in or, or, fi- or, or the, 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 the human wisdom that says it holds the keys to significance, ultimate significance. What does it look like? Chapter 2, verse 6. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Although, here's how it looks. It is not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. We see in verse 6 that there are a few characteristics of this wrong kind of wisdom. Wisdom of this age. It's actually not simply a time, even though when you hear age, you think time, but it's actually a system or a culture. The wisdom of the wisdom that is based on the culture. Paul says that 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 the wisdom that we're imparting, the wisdom that, that gives us our ultimate hope and our ultimate significance is not a wisdom that is based in the culture or on the culture. And why is that? Well, because wisdom based in the culture and on the culture is always shifting wisdom. As the culture shifts, so does the human wisdom that comes with it. So does the ideas. So does the thoughts that, the, the, there, there, there are ideas and thoughts that once sounded ridiculous to us. And eventually, because human wisdom shifts with culture, what happens? Those ideas and thoughts begin to seem plausible to us. They sound reasonable to us. Not because the idea is any more or any less plausible than it once was, but because the culture has changed, giving the ideal or the thought more credibility. Does that make sense to you? You see, when your wisdom is based on the age, when your wisdom is based on the culture, when your wisdom is based on the system in which you live in, then your perspective on sexuality, for example, will always be shifting. Thank you so much. Your perspective, thank you, brother. Yeah, appreciate it. I think my my mic is dying, guys. Dignity of, of humanity will always be shifting, right? Maybe there's at points and times where you value the unborn. Maybe there, and then the culture shifts, and now you no longer value the unborn. Maybe there's points and times where you value certain uh, people based on skin color, or you don't value certain people based on skin color. And then the culture shifts, and then you change who you value. Maybe, maybe it's based on their location in the world. And then the culture shifts, and you no longer value people that you used to value based on their location in the world. And so you're always moving and shifting. You'll mistreat others one minute and treat others with dignity the next minute based solely on what the culture is doing if you base your wisdom on the culture. Does that make sense? You see, this kind of wisdom is always moving. And as a result, we never remain settled in our convictions. We're just shifting and bouncing and going to and fro with the culture. However, Paul is not only pointing to the wisdom of this age that must be rejected. He's pointing to the wisdom of the rulers of this age that must be rejected. What is meant by the rulers of this age? You know, sometimes when we hear these words, rulers of this age, folks that are familiar with the Bible, they're tempted to go right to Ephesians chapter 6 in their mind. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, right, but against what? Rulers, 
against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over, the, over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. In other words, what we're tempted to do is when we read the word rulers in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're thinking immediately about otherworldly forces and saying, well, well what Paul is saying here is he's, he's talking about otherworldly forces and don't be governed by their wisdom. That can be true in a sense, but I don't think that is ultimately what he's speaking to. And my reason for saying that is verse 8 and verse 9. Verse 8, look at verse 8. He says this, none of the rulers of this age understood this, understood the wisdom in which God had hidden. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. In other words, they didn't know who he was. Because if they knew who he was and what he came to do, they would have never crucified him. The rulers of this age that Paul has in mind were the ones who were ignorant concerning the Lord of glory. Their kind of wisdom didn't allow them to see Jesus for who he actually was. But let's be clear. Demonic forces are not ignorant of who Jesus is, nor were they ignorant of who Jesus was. There was a moment in Jesus' ministry, if you're familiar with the Bible, when he encountered two men who were possessed by demons. The scripture says they were so fierce that as people were walking by, they couldn't even get past them. They couldn't, they couldn't get past them because they were so fierce and so ferocious and, and just very aggressive. But, but these two men, when they saw Jesus, they cried out, Oh, Son of God, have you come here to torment us before the time. In other words, the demons were clearly aware of who Jesus was. Clearly aware of who Jesus was. On the flip side, when Jesus is being mocked and scorned and brutalized and crucified by the mobs, egged on by the Roman and Jewish rulers, he cries out in his hour of suffering, Father, forgive them. Why? For they know not what they do. You see, the demonic principalities and rulers of darkness are not ignorant of who Jesus is. But the human rulers are ignorant of who Jesus is. Does that make sense? That's one reason why we believe Paul's call to the rulers of this age is a call to human rulers. Here's another reason. Verse 9. Look at verse 9. But as it is written, what no eye has seen nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, we'll dig deeper into this a, minute, a couple of minutes from now. But for now, I just want you to focus on the fact that Paul says, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, nor the heart of who man imagined. What God has prepared for those who love him. Paul does not appear to be pointing to otherworldly force forces as his main focal point. Paul appears to be pointing to human forces, human rulers of the age, and saying they didn't understand what God was doing in his wisdom. They didn't understand that the, the provision that God was making in this wisdom for those that love him, or for those, yet for those that love him. So that's two reasons that we know when we look at this verse and we hear the words rulers of the age, Paul is most likely confronting the wisdom that is based in human rule of the day. The question is why is Paul confronting this wisdom? Why would Paul confront the wisdom of the human rulers of the day? One reason is because we are inclined to look at the rulers of the age, the rulers of the culture, the rulers of the system, the wealthy, the powerful, the popular, the elite, and say to ourselves, how did they do that? How did they get there? You see, it's easy to look at the rulers of the day and say, well, it, it worked for them so it must be worth listening to and heeding. Does that make sense to you? It must be worth applying to my life and applying 
to my family's life and applying to my friend's life. I mean, if it got them rich, then I need to go after what they did. If it got them powerful, then I need to do what they did. If it got them large and in charge, then I need to do whatever it is that they did. I mean, think about how often at this, at this junction in, in, our, in, our, in our society and in, and in our age that we look to imitate the famous. And we look to imitate the powerful without ever giving any real energy to the question of, is their wisdom righteous? Is their wisdom true? Will their wisdom endure? Will it last? Rather, we just simply see these people and see their claim, see them lay claim to fame, see them lay claim to power, see them lay, lay claim to wealth, and we say, well, I want that, so I need to do what they did in order to get there. When we see people do and say anything to lay claim to, uh, lay claim to fame, do we ask if that wisdom is righteous? When we see people do and say anything to preserve the power or wealth they've, they've acquired, do we say, is that wisdom true? Will that wisdom last? This is the type of wisdom that is at work in our world, and not just in this moment in history, but it's at work in our world in every moment in history, in every place in history. The kind of wisdom that says the ends justify the means. The kind of wisdom that Christians all too often get lured into and lured in with. And this is the wisdom that Paul is saying we must reject. Why is that? One reason Paul says we should reject it is because Paul says in verse 8 that this is the same wisdom that led Jesus to be crucified. This blind craving to be our own God. This relentless pursuit to get or keep our power. This willingness to shed innocent blood. If you feel your claim to power or your keeping of power is being threatened. Folks, that's the same wisdom that was at work when Jesus got crucified. That's the same wisdom that was at work when Jesus was betrayed. That's the same wisdom that was at work when they brought, when they brought trumped up charges and they set them before the, governor, the governors of the day. That's the same wisdom in which he was crucified on. That's one reason why this wisdom must be rejected. We find another reason why this, must, uh, this wisdom must be rejected in verse 6. Look at verse 6 again. It says, yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or the ruler or of the rulers of this age, listen, who are doomed to pass away. Who are doomed to pass away. You see, we watch, we watch them when they're on top with this wisdom at, in operation. This empty wisdom wrapped up in pretty packages. But then when you begin to unwrap it, you realize that it's lacking something. It's empty. It's fleeting. You can follow it, and you can maybe have a bit more success with it. You may even be able to have a bit more approval from man with it. Even maybe a few more dollars in your pocket with it. But it will never, and it cannot, be sustained nor can it sustain you. You see, following the wisdom of the age and the wisdom of the rulers of the age eventually leads you to the same fate in which they will ultimately meet. Emptiness. Deep and abiding emptiness. And a fading away. Does that make sense? No endurance. It will not last. Not simply talking about this life, but more importantly, the life to come. It has no anchor to see it through. This, this is why Paul says it must be rejected. The wisdom of the age, the wisdom of the rulers of the age, 
The wisdom that says that I find ultimate significance by pursuing everything that I, pursuing everything that I want rather than looking to serve others. The wisdom that says that I find ultimate, ultimate hope by just collecting and accumulating more and more and more and more. Rather than saying that life is not found in the abundance of my possessions. The wisdom that says that, that I need to hold on and clutch and grab and do everything I can to hold on to this life because this is the only life I have. Versus the wisdom of Christ which says that if you try to hold on to your life, you're going to lose it. The wisdom that says that I need to try to get as much as I can in this world while I'm living in this world. Versus the wisdom of Christ which says, what does it profit a man to gain this whole world and lose his soul? Paul says that wisdom must be rejected. This is wisdom shaped by the rulers of the age, but it is a wisdom that is sitting in shifting sand. And it is a wisdom that is consumed with a desire to rule and reign apart from God. And because of that, it is a wisdom that is fleeting. What about the wisdom that Paul speaks about? The wisdom that Paul says he is working to impart. What does that wisdom look like? Real wisdom versus the empty wisdom. In our first few sermons, Paul actually gave us some some indicators and some characteristics of this kind of wisdom. He says that this wisdom is rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said that this wisdom is foolishness to those who are perishing. He said that this wisdom was shaped around the death of a Savior. He said that I I came to you only proclaiming one thing, and that was Christ and him crucified. Paul gives us more of what this wisdom looks like in the the passage that we're looking at. Look at verse 7. He says, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. You see, the first quality we notice in this wisdom from this passage is that it is a secret and hidden wisdom. This word secret points to the kind of wisdom that is not readily accessible to everyone. It's not readily available to everyone. In other words, it's not a wisdom that is attained or acquired just by you thinking it through, just by using human knowledge to get to it. It's a wisdom that's revealed by God. Paul comes back to this truth over and over and over again in his writings. You see, this word secret means mystery in this text. And he talks about this mystery over and over and over again in Scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, Romans 16, Colossians 1, Ephesians 3. Colossians 1 and 26, for example, says, The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to the saints. Christ, in you the hope of glory. Paul is saying that the mystery of Christ Jesus, the gospel of Christ Jesus, that Christ came to save, is hidden from the world. Which explains why it doesn't make sense to the world. You see, this is why you must be careful with taking too much confidence in your wittiness to share the gospel. Or in your ability to be liked when you share the gospel. Or in your persuasiveness when you share the gospel. You see, there's nothing wrong, nothing wrong with aiming to be persuasive. Nothing wrong with aiming to be witty. Nothing wrong with aiming to be likable. But none of that ultimately is what's going to open the eyes of someone to receive the gospel. God is going to open someone's eyes to receive the gospel. The gospel is hidden unless revealed by who? God. That's why it's called secret. That's why it's called hidden. One preacher put it like this. He said, I can give my neighbor the ten best books defending the Christian faith ever written. And he can read every single one of them from, from, uh, from cover to cover. He can find them intellectually con- convicting and, convi- and convincing, but still not surrender to God. And embrace God's wisdom over the world's wisdom. Because the act of receiving this wisdom is an exercise of revelation. Not simply an exercise of intellect and will. Do you understand that? You embrace this gospel. 
not simply based on intellect, not simply based on will, but through the revelation of God to you. The second quality we notice in this wisdom is that it is an ageless wisdom. Verse 7, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. Our age and our culture values new wisdom. At least this age does. Anything that comes along that sounds different or appears shiny will often get people following it. New diets, new philosophies, new keys to success, new ideas. However, in the ancient times, credibility wasn't established through newness and, and novelty. Credibility was established through longevity. In other words, the older, the older an idea um, was and was able to stick around, the more credibility that idea carried. How long has an idea been around is what those in antiquity would have asked you. And has it stood the test of time? And here, here Paul is probably getting the attention of the wisdom-seeking audience that he is speaking to. Because he says that the wisdom of God, the wisdom of Christ, the wisdom that has been secret and hidden, but has been revealed by God, was before the ages. It says, you want to talk about old wisdom? You want to talk about ancient wisdom? How about wisdom that was always here? When there was nothing here, this wisdom was here. This wisdom, in other words, is not bound by the location you live in. This wisdom doesn't change based on who you know. This wisdom doesn't change based on what time you live in. This wisdom doesn't change based on what culture you live in. In other words, this wisdom transcends location. This wisdom transcends culture. This wisdom transcends the people that you're around. This wisdom transcends the age. In other words, meaning that while all other wisdom is shifting with the time and the place and the people, this wisdom remains sure and steadfast. And unchanging. The wisdom revealed to us by God in the gospel is not an accidental wisdom. God's wisdom as found in Christ was not in response or in reaction to some other action. It was established before the foundations of the world and has remained constant ever since. Do you want a sense of stability in your life? Embrace the transcendent and steadfast wisdom of God. Turn away from the wisdom of the culture that has you moving in all these different directions based on what flavor of the day is popular. Has you chasing every fad and, and, and find, finding new people to hate one week and new people to love the next week. Embrace the eternal wisdom of God that is found in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Turn to Scripture for direction and guidance in your life. Read Scripture and allow Scripture to read you. This is, this is where we will find more stability. And this is where Scripture tells us we'll find glory. Verse 7 again. Which God decreed before the ages for our glory. What is God's goal in revealing this ageless wisdom to you and I? Our glory. This wisdom is for our glory. Those that follow the wisdom of this age and the rulers of this age will meet a certain and eventual doom, a fading away. But those that follow the wisdom of the Lord will experience a certain and eventual glory. I know sometimes you find yourself looking at all of those around you who are following the wisdom of this world and, and oftentimes observing their successes and, and observing their popularity and, and saying maybe that that's the better course, that that's the better route to take, but be not deceived. Scripture says the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. It is God's wisdom and God's wisdom alone that is found fully in the gospel of Jesus Christ that ultimately leads to your glory. When we embrace 
that wisdom, we can say along with Paul that I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Glory is coming. But remain steadfast. Don't allow the allure of the world to divert your attention and say, maybe I need to chase that wisdom. Verse 9 solidifies it for, us, for, for us. It says, but as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, let me, let me let's, let's chat a little bit. This is a passage that is regularly misinterpreted. Regularly misinterpreted. And it's okay. It's okay. We live and we learn. Some of us see this as a passage about eternity. We think Paul is saying we can't quite fathom how amazing it's going to be. And that's true. We can't quite fathom how amazing it's going to be. But that's not what Paul probably has in mind here. And some of us see this passage about a blessing God is going to give us in this life. This is where, this is where context is really important. You see, the context isn't about God doing something amazing next week. The context isn't about God doing something even amazing next month or even amazing next year for you. Now, that doesn't mean that God isn't going to do something amazing next week or amazing next month or amazing next year. It just means you can't use this scripture to lay claim to it. What does this scripture say? The consensus around what this passage is actually saying is that this mystery, this mystery that we've been talking about, this secret and hidden and eternal and transcendent wisdom of God could not be reached through human means. No eye has seen this wisdom. No ear has heard this wisdom. No heart could ever imagine this wisdom. No one could have ever understood apart from God's revelation that salvation would come when God came to die for men. No one could have ever Understood apart from God's revelation that the true path to life is not by trying to hold on to life, but by being willing to lay it down. No one could have ever understood that the greatest injustice ever carried out in history, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, would satisfy the greatest demand for justice in human history, our sinfulness before a holy and righteous God. No one could have imagined that that's how justice would have been satisfied. But God has prepared this wisdom that no eye could see, no ear could hear, and no heart could imagine for, for those that love him. You say, what's the, what's the motivation for God revealing this wisdom to us? Relationship. For those that love him. And remember, for those that he loved. Because it was what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That whosoever should believe in him would receive the wisdom of God. So God reveals this knowledge, but how does he reveal it? I'm literally going to take like three minutes and we're going to walk through the last six verses. Verse 10, for these, for these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. One of the chief operations of the Holy Spirit is the continual unveiling of God's wisdom through the cross to God's people. And so God reveals this knowledge to us, this secret and hidden knowledge, but he reveals it through the Spirit. And the Spirit continually is revealing it to you. That's what sanctification is. Sanctification is the deepening of your grasp of the wisdom of God. Because as it deepens, your appreciation for what Christ has done increases. And your love and your gratefulness and your thankfulness for him increases. Why? Because of the work of the Spirit at work in you. And there is no one who knows those deep thoughts of God better. You know, me and Candy, we've been married for 
18 years come next month. And we've learned a lot about marriage and how to operate in marriage and what to do and what not to do. And probably I've learned a lot, I've learned a lot more about what not to do than probably she has. But one of the lessons that we've learned is that you never place your assumptions about what your spouse is thinking on your spouse. In other words, you never say, well, it's obvious that you don't care about this. Or it's clear that you don't care about that. Other, you don't try to tell your spouse what they're thinking. Why? Pretty simple. Because you really don't know. You do not know what that person is thinking. You can make some informed decisions based on their emotions, based on their reactions, based on what you're seeing in them. But that's limited knowledge. It's much better to just simply say, this is what I hear you saying, or this is how I perceive how you're feeling. But could you tell me whether or not I'm right or not? Am I, am I, am I, am I on it? Am I, am I missing you? Because it feels like, there, it feels like you're, you're a little upset with me right now. Are you upset with me? Do you want to talk? Why is that? Why should, why should you do that? Because you are not in their mind, and so you simply do not know. And this is precisely what Paul has in mind in verse 11 and 12 when he says, For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. Man is constantly trying to understand God apart from God. They're trying to make sense of what God is thinking and what God is doing apart from God. Making statements like, well, if there was a God, he would never do this. Or he would never do that. How do we know? Are you God? What are we talking about? So, so we're trying to dictate to God based on how we think he should operate. Paul says no one understands God except the spirit of God. It's like me trying to place my thoughts on my wife and tell her what she's thinking. That doesn't work. The one who is most suited to speak on God's behalf regarding his wisdom and his thoughts is his very own spirit. The spirit that has been revealed to us through the person and work of Jesus Christ. You want to know what God thinks? Look to Christ. The spirit that has been revealed to us through the words of his prophets. You want to know what God thinks? Read your Bible. The spirit that has been revealed to us through the writings of his apostles. You want to know what God thinks? Read the New Testament. The natural person, verse 14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This is what it's saying, simply put. Until a person's heart has been awakened to see Jesus, then oftentimes it's going to be extremely difficult trying to explain the wisdom of Jesus. Do you understand? And so often we try to put the wisdom of Jesus before the reception of Jesus. And then we wonder why people don't get it. The natural mind cannot understand all that the spiritual mind unveils. The spirit unveils so much of the wisdom of God. And so one of the great mistakes that we make is trying to appeal purely to a person's reason when we share and when we show God's wisdom. No. The first step in embracing God's wisdom is embracing God's son. They might, you might not understand everything that there is to know about the way of Jesus from the outside. But it's because, simply put, you weren't supposed to understand it all from the outside. It's on the inside when the Spirit awakens a heart and the Spirit indwells a soul that the, the wisdom of Christ 
begins to become realer and re- or more and more real in a person's life and increases in a person's life. Why so or how so? Verse 16, for who understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. You see, when you embrace the person and work of Jesus, you receive the mind of Jesus. And your eyes are open to begin to see life as he would have you see it. Does that make sense? You begin to die to the world. Your taste for the world changes. Your appetite for uh, the world changes. What you pursue changes. What you hope in changes. And why is that? It's because you have the mind of Christ. And now the wisdom of Christ is shaping your decisions. And as you continue to spend time with Christ and spend time in the word of Christ, what happens? The wisdom of Christ increases. Growth happens. Maturity happens. Sanctification happens. This is the call of the, this is the Christian life, saints of God. This is the Christian life, saints of God. May we all pursue it, and in so doing, may we grow in the wisdom which God has revealed to us by his spirit. Let's pray. God, we love you and thank you.